Welcome to the Real News Network. I'm Sharmini Pires coming to you from Baltimore. After a long time of uncertain democratic leadership in Haiti, a new parliamentary and presidential elections are scheduled for October 9th. While there are 27 candidates running for president, according to analysts, there are only four that has a good chance of winning the presidency. One of them is Dr. Maurice Narcy of the Fan Me Lovelass Party, which is the party of former President Bertrand Aristide. If elected, she would become Haiti's first female president. On to talk about all of this with me is Danny Glover. Danny Glover is an activist who has been most passionately following Haitian politics for decades. He joins us today in our Baltimore studio. Danny, pleasure to have you with us. Thank you, Shamini. Good. It's good here be, to be with The Real News again. And I should mention, Danny's also on the board of The Real News Network. Um, Danny, um, you are supporting uh, Dr. Maris Narcy yes. for president of uh, Haiti. Yes. And uh, the one thing that is, of course, concerning you uh, is that you've always been a supporter of the party that she's running for, which yes, is the yes. party of uh, Bertrand Aristide, yes. the uh, Fan Me Lovelace party. Yes. And uh, so why are you supporting her candidacy? Well, certainly uh, when we think about uh, family Lavalas, uh, the party which is the party of the people of Haiti and the enormous role that, that it has played in simply rebuilding itself, the role that it has played in becoming a very important voice within the Haitian political uh, framework. And the fact that they've more or less resurrected themselves as well. Uh, it is the People's Party. Uh, it's it candidates, uh, it, Dr. Maurice Narcy has been an outspoken uh, critic of the the present government, uh, the previous government. They, she has been an outspoken uh, advocate for justice, for health care, for education, for making, uh, allowing Haiti to, to independently, Haiti and its people, determine their own history and their own destiny. Uh, certainly, uh, we, we've, uh, her, her, career uh, as not only a member of family Lavalas, but her career as, as someone who has administered health care, who has been there with the people in their, in their desperate situation. This is the candidate that Haiti needs at this particular point in her history. That's why I'm supporting her. Danny, as we know, there's been a cholera outbreak in Haiti. Um, that the United Nations and the peacekeeping forces have taken actual responsibility for. In fact, Ban Ki-moon at the General Assembly uh, just a few days ago acknowledged that this was a great failure on the part of the United Nations. Yes. Um, being a physician might be a good thing as far as securing the health care of the people of Haiti that's not only suffering from uh, this particular cholera outbreak, but many other uh, diseases as well as a result of lack of sanitation and health care for Haitians. How do you think uh, a doctor leading up uh, the country uh, would, the impact that would have on the country? I can imagine that, that there couldn't be, there, there could not be anyone who would be as prepared, knowledgeable, and who would call to action the resources, not only within Haiti, but within the, uh, 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 in the world community to address the issues. As, as we know that, that under the President Aristide, there have been many attempts to, to elevate the life, the life expectancy, the life, the life of Haitian people whether it's bringing in Cuban doctors, whether it's being supported by President Chavez and, and Venezuela in training doctors, training doctors 
to perform and work in the most disadvantaged and disenfranchised communities within Haiti. This was, this was part of what the work that family Lavalas did and responded, responded to, not, all, not before the cholera uh, outbreak, but in a general sense of elevating Haiti and bringing Haiti's health care, educational systems to a place where the Haitian people were, were the beneficiaries of it, were the ones who were actually, uh, who actually were, uh, were crafting their own democracy in, in doing that, raising pay, you know, uh, minimum wage. All those are things that have been carried on before. It's unfortunate that, one, the earthquake and the subsequent uh, uh, travesties around the electoral process after the earthquake is unfortunately that, that though that work was truncated and that work didn't continue. Uh, but that, did we go back to, to 1990 when, when President Bertrand Aristide was first elected and the subsequent over, overthrow the coup d'etat. Danny, as you said, there's been two coup d'etats mm -hmm. in Haiti. Uh, give us a sense of that history. The first coup d'etat was almost immediately after the election of uh, Bertrand Aristide. And it was a military coup. It was a military coup by the old forces from the unpopular regime, uh, the Papa Da and Baby Da regime. So the first thing was the military coup that happened there. Aristide went into exile. And then there was a reign of terror where men and women activists were forced either to leave the country, were imprisoned, tortured, and murdered. And countless people were murdered during this first coup. Aristide was in, in exile in the United States and gained a great deal of support. Uh, uh, artists like myself, uh, Jonathan Demme, and a whole host of, of, of men and women came to his defense and came to Haiti's defense at the particular point in time. Randall Robinson went on a hunger strike. Soon, uh, some time after that, uh, Aristide was restored to complete his presidency and, and certainly completed that presidency after just a very, uh, which was very short, as I said, truncated. And, and yet was, what happened was various um, obstacles were placed in Haiti's way and those obstacles were, did not allow the Haitian, the Haitian people, those people who were the stewards of the wishes and demands of the Haitian people to go on and, and, and make uh, and, and create the Haiti that they envisioned. When you say obstacles, what do you mean by that? Well, loans uh, were, uh, uh, were specifically not, not uh, were not received, uh, development loans. And then I think, what, what else has happened? We don't understand what happens with the coup d'etat and the destabilization process through fear, intimidation, murder. All those things play a role in creating an, an, a, an atmosphere in which the, the, the party, this revolutionary party, we might say, this new party who now represents the aspirations of the, the Haitian people, those things now are are indeterminate now. The, the, the levels of trust, the levels of, of coercion, the, the levels of bribery, all those things now take center stage within the government that President Aristide now reassumed, the position he reassumed after that. So he's, he, he has this, this short period of time that he, he is president he steps down as president, which was part of the agreement, stepped down. Rene Preval was elected president and, and, and fulfilled uh, his responsibility. And, and certainly it was under uh, uh, Rene Preval, President Rene Preval, Pre Preval in 2010 that the earthquake occurred. That was after the second coup, which had taken place in 2004 the bicentennial of the Haitian Revolution. How ironic that in 2004, in February 29, 2004, there's another coup d'etat as the Haitians are celebrating their 200th year as a nation. 
it's almost invalidated their existence as an independent, sovereign people, this second coup. Aristide, who had been elected, uh, had been elected after the first service, after his first service, then Rene Prabal took over, he was elected again. One, overwhelmingly, as much as 90%, 96% of the, the voters voted for Aristide and, and to win this election. Another coup has happened. And this is, this is a coup, the different kind of coup, where no more than about 250, and I'll use the term bandits, made they worry, heavily armed with U.S. uniforms and guns, made they were from the D Dominican Republic, and then offered the, the, another obstacle, or presented another obstacle to the Haitian people. Aristide had disbanded the Haitian army. There was only a minimal police force that had no ammunition, no spare parts, et cetera. All this was the fallacy that, or, or the, 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 certainly the instruments that were used to, to create the, the second coup. The United Nations came in as that. The U.S. called the United Nations in. Well, just to one detail, the, uh, during the second coup uh, yeah. on Aristide, um, he was flown out of Haiti in a U.S. plane. He was flown out of Haiti in a U.S. plane. And he was sat on a tarmac for days in the Central, uh, Central African Republic, which was a military dictatorship. He wasn't allowed to come return to the hemisphere. And finally, uh, the South African government, Thabo Mbeki, welcomed him, where he spent uh, seven years in exile from 2004 until 2000. And 11, and in 2011, I had the opportunity to accompany him and his family, Mildred and his children, from South Africa with uh, with uh, 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 a small group of people to to Haiti again, just before the election that resulted in, in the uh, uh, the presidency of. of uh, Martelique, former, Michelle Martelique. Pre former President Aristide uh, was allowed back into the country on the condition that he would not stand for election. He would not stand for election, yeah. And, uh, and I remember while you and Amy Goodman and others were yes. in flight with him returning from South Africa, um, you did that in order to ensure that he would safely be returned to Haiti and not flown somewhere else. Yes, not flown somewhere else. And, and at, at a very, we had a very small window at that time, the small window for him to return. Uh, Rene Proval had made it possible by stating that, that he welcomed the president back, the former president back. And we had that small window between with, with the uh, Proval's, Proval's statement and the election itself. And uh, now, uh, who is behind all of this? We alluded to the fact that uh, President Aristide, after the coup, was flown out in a US plane. Uh, but the hidden hand behind all of this is the United States. That's no secret. Um, they have always interfered in the Haitian electoral process. Um, what's at stake for the United States? What is the strategic interest of Haiti, a poor nation, one of the poorest nations in the world? Well, if, if we go, if we look at what's literally at stake, you know, we, we could say that Haiti represents a, a access to cheap labor, uh, for industries to, and there are many industries now. Uh, we, there's a whole list of industries that are popular and, and certainly uh, wealthy industries that pay the smallest amount of, of money uh, uh, per employee, per hour, imaginable. But there's something else that I think that we missed the boat on in terms of Haiti. And Haiti's peculiar history Haiti did something in 1804 that had never done, been done in human history. I'm just saying, not just history, human history. What Haiti did in 1804 was Haiti became the, the, a slave rebellion resulting in the first time that a nation was formed. 
It had never been done in human history that a slavery rebellion led to the formation of a, hate, of, of a government and a state. And, and actually, what made it so, uh, the ir irony of the whole thing is that revolution took place within, within a historic moment in human history where you had the French, American, French Revolution, the American Revolution, and Haiti, and the Haitian Revolution. And some would argue that the Haitian Revolution articulated and realized the ideals of the other two Haitian, uh, the other two revolutions. So I think, I think on something, Haiti perhaps has never been forgiven for that. We may say that the Cubans may never be forgiven for what happened in 1959. But Haitians have never been forgiven for that. And certainly, if we look at the history of Haiti, the extraordinary, extraordinary impact that that revolution had on the abolitionist movement in the United States, the great Simon Boulevard came to Haiti in 1813, received funds, monies, and everything else, and, and, and went on to liberate South America. President Chavez always said, we owe so much to the Haitian people. Frederick Douglass, the great liberator, the great abolitionist said, we owe so much to the Haitian people. In that sense, these extraordinary men and women who have that, that legacy becomes the, the part of their own psychic and historic memory as well. So when we, we even as today, we talk about the overturning of the fraudulent elections that happened last year, November, October last year. We talk about that. It was the will of the Haitian people that made that happen. It was the will of the Haitian people, their active participation in demanding that those elections be overturned that allow us to look at, at October 9th as a possible moment in which we, they can reclaim their own dignity Dignity is the word they use, their own sovereignty. All right, Denny, let's, uh, in segment two, take up why you're specifically supporting the candidacy of Dr. Maurice Narcy. Okay. Thank you for joining us on The Real News Network, and stay tuned. <laughs> 